Okay, when we read yesterday, we found out that Benjamin's mom had been sold, and uh, we stopped soon after that. So I'm going to pick up from there. It says, But as Anne sat with her head bowed and listened for her father's prayer of thanks for the mighty blessings of the food, their home, and their family, she realized that no amount of fancy food or clothes or land could make her happier than the love of her family made her at that moment. So maybe it wasn't upside down after all. It was just an early Thanksgiving. Chapter 7. Benjamin cried a little less and laughed a little more each day. When he asked about his mother, their answer was always the same. She'll come see you at Christmas if she can. And so Benjamin's daily question soon became, Is it Christmas today? Anne was always impatient for Christmas to arrive. And this year, Benjamin's patience impatience added to her own. Christmas was, without a doubt, the very best time of the year. In fact, it was the only time of the year other than Independence Day and Good Friday when they didn't have to work six days a week. And Christmas wasn't just a one-day holiday, it was a whole week off from work, stretching all the way until New Year's Day. Some slaves got permission to travel to visit family during that week, and so the Weemses were expecting quite a bit of company. Soon after Thanksgiving, they began to get ready. They saved apples gathered from the orchard floor. They hoarded black walnuts. Arabella kept throwing away scraps from a red dress she made for Mistress Carol and used them to make hair ribbons for Anne and Catherine. Benjamin wanted one too, but Arabella told him, boys don't wear hair ribbons, and she made him a red bow tie instead. Up in the loft, which they now shared with Benjamin, they spent their last few sleepy moments at night discussing the delicacies, the biscuits, the real bread, and maybe even cakes their mother would make with the peck of wheat flour and the quart of molasses that Master Charles would give them at Christmas morning. They also wagered bets on which item of livestock they would receive for their Christmas dinner. He's stingy as an old crow. I say he gives us one scrawny chicken like he did last year said Augustus. I want a hog, a big fat hog to roast in the fire pit, said Joseph dreamily. I'd rather have a turkey, said Catherine. We eat fat back all year. Why do you want to eat more pig on Christmas? She jabbed Joseph in the ribs with her toes. At Elton Farm, they roasted a whole ox last year, Addison chimed in. That's because it broke its neck, said Anne. They won't have an ox this year for sure. They weren't quiet for a moment, pondering all the possibilities. What do you want for Christmas dinner, Benjamin? Anne asked. His choice sleeping place was between her and Catherine, and he had been gently kicking her thigh during the entire discussion. Stars, he said simply. Stars? Anne propped herself on her elbows, but it was too dark in the windowless loft for her to detect Benjamin's expression. The older boy snickered. You want to eat stars, boy? she asked. Yes, he answered. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Anne could feel Catherine grinning, <coughs> and by now Joseph was giggling. Why? she asked him. Benjamin stopped kicking. So if I eat stars, I can fly to where my mama is. Anne pulled him close to her and wrapped her blanket over his to keep him extra warm. That's a good idea, Benjamin, she said in his ear. As she drifted off to sleep, she imagined that she floated up into the inky black winter sky and flew free with the stars. Their cousins Hannah and David arrived from Rockville on Christmas morning, and the relatives from farther away were there by noon. They all started walking the night before. They came carrying sacks of potatoes and turnips, baskets of eggs, kegs of molasses, and limp chickens dangling by their feet from carrying poles. They brought all of the special food they'd been given by their own masters, along with plates and spoons, blankets and banjos to add to the celebration. And so as not to be a burden on Anne's family for the week during which they would share their home. In the midst of these happy arrivals, Anne looked up the hill to see Richard watching, his mouth slightly open. She felt her anger flare, 
This was her time. It was her family. He had no right to watch as if their merriment were on display for him. She strode up to him to confront him. What do you want? she demanded. Richard was startled as if she had awakened him. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas, he said, blushing. Anne crossed her arms over her chest. Huh, Merry Christmas. She returned with only a sliver of warmth. My brother says, come on up and get your presents. We're leaving for my sister's house in a little while, so he said, come soon. As he spoke, his gaze kept shifting back to the scene in front of Anne's cabin, where Anne exclaimed over children and grown so much in the past year, and uncles laughed loudly, slapping each other on the back. Ha ha ha! At first, Anne wanted to grasp his head and turn it away. Then she found herself blinking in disbelief as she recognized the emotion in his eyes. He was looking at the scene not with disdain, not or not even with curiosity, but he was looking at it with longing. I'll go get my father, she said, now eyeing him with curiosity. Richard nodded and, re and turned to climb the hill. He was wearing his Sunday best and looked cleaner than Anne had ever seen him. She surmised that the soap he'd been scrubbed with was about as strong as her mama's soap, because as he walked, he scratched. First his neck, then his armpit, then his rump. Anne ran to her cabin, where her family was crowding inside to warm up. Papa, she tugged on her father's sleeve. Master Charles says, come on and get our presents. Then let's go, he said, and invited her along to help carry things. At the stone house, they found Master Charles hitching the horses to the carriage in preparation for the trip to his sister's house. Here, let me do that for you, Master Charles, her father said, and took the reins from him to finish the job. Master Charles willingly stepped back from the carriage and brushed himself off. He too was dressed in his Sunday best, and surprisingly he looked sober. John, Master Charles began, with an air of defensiveness about him, it wasn't a very good year for harvest this year, as you well know. No, Master, it wasn't a very good year. Her father nudged the bit into the mare's mouth. I'd wanted to be able to give your family a couple of turkeys this year. I know the boys of yours are shooting up like corn stalks. Yes, sir, Master Charles, they certainly is. But, Master Charles continued, as he picked horsehair off his black wool trousers, I can't even afford the turkeys. I'm sure you understand. Yes, sir, Master, I do understand. Her father patted the mare on her neck and she nibbled at his shirt. But I do have that old sheep that went lame. She won't be the most tender meat for your Christmas dinner, but she'll provide you with more than you can eat. Thank you, Master. Thank you kindly. Her father bowed slightly. Mistress Carroll came out of the house, a long wool cloak covering her red Christmas dress Anne's mother had made for her. It's time to go. We don't want to be late, she said briskly. To Anne, she said, I've left a sack of flour and a jug of molasses in the pantry for your mother. You go get them, one sack and one jug. I don't want to find anything else missing when I return. She began to step up into the carriage. Then she turned as if she'd forgotten something. She opened a small leather purse. Since it's the season for Christian giving, here, take this. She selected several coins and she held them out for Anne to take. The coins felt cold in Anne's hand. Five copper, one cent pieces, large and heavy. Share them with your brothers and sister said Mistress Carol. Why, thank you, ma'am, Anne said softly. Her father carried the sheep over his shoulder, and Anne balanced the sack of flour on one hip and the jug of molasses on the other. The coins she clutched in one hand? She wondered as they came down the hill toward the little cabin if they looked anything like the wise men who came bearing gifts for the Christmas child. Anne was thankful that butchering the sheep was her father's job. She busied herself, helping to stoke the fire in the pit, until a thick bed of glowing coals warmed the gray winter day. The chickens, plucked and gutted, and the sheep, skinned and gutted, were then thrown onto the coals to cook. Master Charles would have written them passes so they could travel to visit relatives, 
but Anne was happy to have the relatives come to them. That way, their home was filled with laughter and music, dancing, and the smells of good things to eat, and these things lingered even after Christmas, the memories clinging to the beams of the cabin. They ate crowded around the table or gathered in front of the hearth. No one, when no one could eat another bite, her uncles brought out banjos and harmonicas, and her cousin David beat out the rhythms of the music on his chest and on his thighs, as if her, his body was a drum. Catherine danced with Benjamin in her arms, her bare feet slapping the dirt floor, her crimson hair ribbon and Benjamin's bow tie, bright as blood, with Benjamin clapping and laughing, until Catherine's breath caught in her throat, and Arabella made her sit to rest. When it was time for the children to go to bed, Benjamin asked for the hundredth time, when will, when will my mama get here? Anne had already heard enough bits of conversation to know that nobody had heard of Ellen. Ellie. Nobody heard from Ellie. That most certainly meant she'd been sold into the deep south, Alabama or maybe Mississippi, too far south to send word back from and too far away to walk home for a Christmas visit. Anne watched as her mother sank into a chair and sat Benjamin on her knee, facing her. Arabella sighed, dreading what she had to say. Your mama can't come home this Christmas, baby, she said quietly. Benjamin's face got all crumpled up. He closed his eyes, and his cry came out as a hum from between his clenched teeth. You will see her again, Benjamin, Arabella was saying. She's going to wait for you in heaven, and I promise you're going to see her there. But her voice was flat. It was deadened by the knowledge that a future in heaven was little comfort for a child that's so young. Anne lifted Benjamin from her mother's knees and let his tears soak into the shoulder of her dress. She helped him climb the ladder to the loft, and she held him as he cried himself to sleep. The loft was crowded with six young cousins now sharing the sleeping quarters. Anne lay awake even after the other children were sound asleep. She listened to the conversation in the room below, where the older cousins and adults gathered in front of the fire. Their talk was alive with news of her Uncle Abram, now Uncle William, and Aunt Mimi, and their new baby daughter. It was her cousin David who sometimes worked at the docks in Georgetown, who gotten the news from a ship captain from New York, a man whom Uncle William had sometimes worked, loading and unloading his ship at the New York Harbor. They had to go, she heard David say. Master found out they were in New York, and a slave catcher was on his way to hunt them down. They say it's horrible cold up there in Canada West, said an elderly aunt. Can't plant until July, and you got to harvest in August before it frosts. Hmm, chimed in an uncle. In January, if you open your mouth, your spit will freeze. Anne heard Hannah's laugh above the others. Uncle William and Aunt Mimi, they're going to do just fine, she said. Uncle still has his dream of owning land. Maybe in Canada he'll be able to. There was a murmur of agreement. Anne wondered what Canada must be like. Was it really as cold as they said? She pictured Uncle Abram with his hair frosted white with snow and ice, and what it must be like to be free, really free, in a country where slave catchers weren't even allowed to hunt fugitives. She felt a tug at her heart, love for her aunt and for her uncle, and feeling how much she missed them. She went to sleep imagining them sawing and hammering, building the house her uncle had always dreamed of. And that's the end of chapter 7. Okay, now it's inquiry time. That's always a hard word for me to say for some reason. Inquiry, inquiry, inquiry. But in inquiry query time today, I want you to get a little bit of a head start on what we're going to do on our next unit. I know I keep talking about that unit, but um, it's coming up. We're finishing all of our videos and stuff for bullying. We took a little time out from our unit because I think bullying is really important. And today what I want you to do is um, research a little bit about which invention you think 
is the most important one that was invented at that time. It says, we will be learning about the turn of the century and focusing on the years from 1880 through 1920. Research on the internet and make a list of some of the inventions that were made during those years. You don't have to write all of them down because that would be too long. The list would be really long, trust me. Lots of things were invented between those years, thousands of things. Just make a list of the ones you think were the most important or influential. Also, think about it and then circle the one that you might like to build a model of or do a report on. You know, take your time, do some research on the internet, look at the inventions, you know, think about what realistically you could make. Like, you know, that time, it's not that they were invented at that time, but definitely uh, rail, railroads were increased, the amount of them were increased, and um, the use of railroads was replacing um, cattle drives, and they didn't need to drive cattle anymore because then they could put the, you know, they could put the cattle on trains and move them like that. So um, if you made a model with trains, if you found out something like that was invented at that time, that would be cool. But um, if you made a model of anything, you just got to think, is it something I can really make a model of? Do I want to be the one, like when we went over to Da Vinci that time, and we saw some kids look like they had it lickety split. Some kids look like they knew what they were talking about. Those kill, kids that build a turbine, I mean, they knew what they were talking about. Water power in China, yeah, they knew about water power in China. But then some of those other kids were like reading things off of a wall, and we talked about that. Well, you guys, when we did the Civil War, you guys rocked it. I'm telling you, you guys made me so proud. You make me look good, but the truth is, at the same time, you guys make yourselves look good. Because, you know, when people walk in and they see what you do, they were like, wow, these kids fired up learning, um, sharing what you learned, it was awesome. And I think you got better than you did on the first unit. So this is going to be the third one now. You guys should really be rocking this one out. So go ahead and research that, <laughs> figure out which one you want to do. Then when you're done with that, we're going to finish the day off with writing, you know. Um, you guys are all at different stages of your writing right now. Some people are planning a new paper. I know Maddie came up and said, can I do a new paper? Of course, Maddie, you can do a new paper. You can do a new one, finish that one, then do another new one. You can do ten of them. I don't care. I mean, the more you write, the better you get. And most of you guys are really impressing me because you're really good writers already, and you're just going to get better and better. So you're either planning, you're writing, you're or you're editing, okay? If you finish editing, then you can start another new topic. And you guys know, I'm not just saying it. I'm not just talking the talk. I'm walking the walk because I get up there at the podium and I write also, okay? So it's fun to write. You get your ideas down. But what do I say is the most important part of writing? It's the planning. You got to plan. Make a good plan and you'll make a good paper. It's just that simple, okay? So go ahead, whatever step you're on, work on that. If you finish it, you got time. If you're, if, you know, if we're doing this, it's a snow day. You go to recess, go outside, run your fingers through a little snow, play with a little bit of snow, then come back in and do some writing, you know? Um, start a new paper if you have time. But um, most of all, just have fun with it, you know, because writing can be fun. And once you finish your writing, guess what? There's no homework, nah, because everything you just did was homework. So enjoy the rest of your day, and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again tomorrow. Bye.